morning. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're glad you're here today worshiping with us at Unity Christian Church on this fourth Sunday of the new year. And uh, we're glad to have Jason and Heather back. And when we get, you know, with, what is it? When we get those two, we get the whole package here. So uh, we're back to full force, live and in person. Aren't you glad to see all of them back? Hey, and Joel's back, and he's been kind of busy over the last, uh, what, three months? Whitney is back with us today, and we're glad to see you. So glad to see you. We're glad you're here. We're continuing in our Cradle to the Cross series, uh, and basically what we're doing through this series is taking the words of Jesus and throughout his three-year ministry and uh, seeing how they impact us as followers of Jesus Christ. I kind of call it directives for discipleship. And uh, we're going to be talking about injustice. Uh, so hang in there. Before we get to that, the team's going to come and lead us together. Would you please stand as we sing together? Well, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say before we begin that we have missed you so much. And uh, we are just so glad to be back here in person. And uh, this morning... Um, we're going to uh, start the service off with a new song, and this is called God So Loved, and it's based off of John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, and um, we're going to sing this together today, so let's try this course together, for God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in Him will live forever. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of So love, 
nations come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting there with open arms this morning. Please be seated. So isn't it great to have these guys all back, huh? Yeah. The whole gang. The band back together. <laughs> We're glad to have them back and uh, Joel especially uh, and uh, Whitney. I don't know if saw, she was sitting in the lobby because she was in first service but she's back with us today and healing nicely. So uh, your prayers, all of our prayers have been answered and we're, we're just glad to see everybody uh, that's usually up here back. 
Now, you may not be as glad to see me, <laughs> but that's okay, you know. You know. <laughs> We've been in uh, uh, this, this kind of a non-series. Um, you'll see that it's kind of from the cradle to the cross, right? We, talked, we got through Christmas, and I've always wanted to take just uh, over the course of the life and ministry, mostly ministry of Jesus, and, and, and talk about what Jesus talked about. And I kind of, the subtitle is Directives for Discipleship, and uh, we've been talking about just basically what Jesus has asked us and is asking us as his followers to be and to do. So today is hang in there. Hang in there. Uh, and we want, I want to take just a few minutes and talk about injustice because we've all been there. Let me give you a, a pseudo definition of injustice. Uh, attacks of injustice are limited to people who breathe. <laughs> and typically occur somewhere between birth and death. <laughs> so, so that pretty much includes all of us, right? Uh, Injustice manifests itself in irritability, short fuses, and mountain ranges of molehills. <laughs> Don't look at anybody right now because you're thinking, oh, I... The common symptoms of injustice victims are the repetition of questions beginning with who, what, why, and how. Who does that person think they are? What were they thinking? Why does this have to happen to me all the time? And how is that fair? Now, there are three ways we can deal with injustice. We can flee it, you know, run away from it. Some opt to flee it, and the way they opt to flee it is simply to sweep it under the rug and forget about it, you know. Let's just not deal with this right now. Let's just move on. Uh, unfortunately, we know if you've experienced the sweeping it under the rug and forgetting about it, you know that doesn't work, right? Right? You know, because sooner or later, the bump under the rug gets too big to move around in the room. Huh? Others will try to fight it. And maybe, you know, that's where most of us are. You know, we do things like unfriend them <laughs> or block them from being able to call us. See, there's all kinds of new ways to fight this in, this in this new 21st century, you know. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can unfollow them and they don't even know it. <laughs> You just stop seeing their posts, you know. How about this? Here's an old-fashioned one. Flash your headlights back at them. You know, I'll show you. You're going to blind me. I'll let you have it, you know. And, and some people even go to the extent of having that rack put up on top of the cab of the truck, you know. So you hit them with all of them, buddy, you know. I'll teach you a lesson. I'll blind you, you know, like the sun. We got all kinds of ways we fight injustice. We throw a party, you know, and don't invite them. Nah, 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 nah. Circulate gossip. One of the probably the most ways, uh, best ways, or one of the most commonly used ways to fight injustice is to honk your horn. <laughs> you know, I, I I had a guy honk his horn at me the other day, and I don't have any idea what I did. <laughs> you know, I thought, what was it? What what I do? What I do? I, other ways we fight injustice is we'll criticize, uh, circulate gossip. Maybe you have your own creative way of fighting injustice in your life. I hope I never get to or have to experience your creative ways. <laughs> but fighting back doesn't get us anywhere, does it? The eye for an eye strategy just leaves everybody with black eyes <laughs> or blind. A few, however, discover another treatment for injustice. You can flee it. You can fight it. Or the third possibility is the only option open to those who are serious about following Jesus Christ. And that is to forgive it. Forgive it. Listen to this. Jesus says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you, and take your tunic, countersue them. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's not what it says. <laughs> if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. 
If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now you read that and you say, well, that's all good in the first century, Bruce, but this is the 21st century. That kind of stuff doesn't apply to us today in this dog-eat-dog world, in this world of injustice. We've got to flee it or we've got to fight back. But it's outrageous to listen and and hear the words of Jesus and think, "I, I can't do that because we've become so accustomed. It's kind of more natural for us to flee it, forget about it, or fight it. And more times than not, we're fighting it, (laughs) right? We are. There's no way we can live up to the standard that Jesus lays out for those who follow him. But hold on a minute. Just hold on a second here because, you know, there's maybe this command isn't so outrageous after all. Maybe it's actually a great prescription that benefits those who forgive and those who are forgiven. See, it's a two-way street. In Matthew 5, Jesus takes us back to God's intentions, his true intentions for those people who are called to follow him, which have little to do with fighting or fleeing injustice. Jesus tells us to respond to evil with love, to match insult with blessing, to offer smiles in exchange for scowls, and to give forgiveness in place of bitterness. See, this whole idea of following Jesus puts us in the community that we call the church. That's who we are. And, and we're, we're a big community, not just here, but around the world. And of all people, the expectation, even the command, is to exchange forgiveness in the place of bitterness. Where broken bones of division are healed, where hostility is diffused, and where gaps of hurt are bridged, Just think about it. When we become that community that he has called us to be, can you imagine the potential for restoration for feuding families? Co-workers? How about the potential for restoration uh, for racial barriers? Jesus goes on. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See, one of the indicators of our adoption to God is that we treat people just exactly like Jesus says we're to treat people. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers... What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day thought they had it all figured out, had it all worked out, because they had determined that loving your neighbors to them meant that you just have to love all the good people. You just have to love all the people who are like you or like me. That's that's the only one. See, And they'd already figured out that they could go ahead and hate the Samaritans because they were out there. They were different. They could go ahead and hate all the tax collectors. They could even hate the Romans because they'd occupied their country. We tend to call that a righteous hatred, which, by the way, is a tailored suit that always seems to fit. You just call it, I'll just call it a righteous hatred, you know, because it's, it's righteous because, because they don't think like I think or they don't believe like I believe. And because what they believe and what they stand for, it goes against everything I stand for, uh, then it's okay for me to hate them. Wrong. Wrong. And i got to tell you, this is a lesson I've had to learn myself. (laughs) You know, it's this idea of saving your loving and your compassionate behavior for those you like (laughs) and those who like you. While you are okay to unleash your bitterness and your hate on your enemies. You say, wait a minute, now you're getting kind of... I don't have any enemies, Bruce. Really? (laughs) The way things have been going? (laughs) 
Who doesn't have enemies, right? Who doesn't? Even if we've created them in our own mind and heart, we all have enemies these days. You may consider that the guy leaving office is your enemy. Or the guy taking the office is your enemy. Or how about this? The person who kept the opponent's sign in their yard long after the election, as if they're gloating or holding out hope. You pick. Your enemy might be a teacher or a professor or a boss who refuses to cut you any slack. Your enemy may be uh, someone who, who doesn't look like you or sound like you. Your enemy may be a girlfriend or a boyfriend who broke your heart or a former friend who broke your confidence or an ex-spouse who broke your marriage. Now maybe all of a sudden it gets real quiet in here. Because <laughs> maybe I've quit preaching and gone to meddling a little bit. Huh? You know? <laughs> and maybe right now over that category or other categories that you've got on, going on in your own mind and heart. <laughs> you know? You may be, hopefully you're thinking about that person. You've, you've brought their picture to your mind. And whatever you do, you don't look at them right now. All right? Because <laughs> you go. How about we talk about real people and real relationships and real conflict and real injustice? Better yet, let's talk about the path to healing because that's what he has called us to do. Exactly what do you need to do about that person that you've got on your mind right now? I would say on your heart. But they're probably more on your nerves than, you're on your, than they are on your heart. So at least you got a picture there. There's my enemy. There's a problem, a person I have real issues with. See, it's too general just to say, well, we're supposed to love them. How many times, well, I, I don't hate them because I'm supposed to love them. But Jesus uses a word far more specific than the idea of generally loving someone. It doesn't just imply that we are to love. It actually suggests and commands some, an attitude and an action of love towards those enemies. And as difficult as it sounds, Jesus is urging us to look for the best in our enemies. And to offer help if they need it. To have a sense of goodwill and benevolence toward toward our enemies, toward our adversaries, toward our opponents, in spite of their lack of the same toward us, you know. He's actually encouraging us to pray for the welfare of our enemies and the well-being of their families. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You know, he kind of lets us off the hook a little bit because technically he, we're not being asked or commanded to like them. <laughs> you don't have to like them because I'm pretty sure that would require an emotion that we just can't conjure up <laughs> despite our best. In, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to like them. I'm going to do my best. To, no, you're not, <laughs> you know. We don't have to approve what they are or what they've done. We don't have to approve how they conduct their affairs, but we are to love who they are because they are people who matter to God, just like me, just like you, just like the people you do like in your circle. We all matter to God. Even your enemy, adversary, and opponent matter to God. People who have failed. People who have failed you are still eligible for God's forgiving grace. They're still eligible. God still loves them. Just as they are eligible for our forgiving grace. In fact, the Bible says, Paul writes in Romans 5, he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amazingly, God's response to our rebellion with him 
wasn't to declare war on us, who do you think would win that battle? Huh? <laughs> uh, here's the, here, I, 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 you know, uh, my friend for 60 years, Tim Seavers from over at Sherman Church of Christ, is visiting today. And we've been friends for 60 years. We've known each other from the time we were about five years old, right? So it's 60, give or take. <laughs> <laughs> and I was he's younger than I am okay <laughs> but, but and he knows this he knows it uh, because we share a, a lot of the uh, of similar experiences in our relationship and our walk with the Lord his dad was my uh, my family's preacher and uh, so so I, really you left before you know you were still He's younger, okay? So anyway, here's the thing. I became a Christian. I committed my life to Jesus Christ when I was 10 years old, okay? I grew up in, in, a, in a generational Christian family. My grandparents, my, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents were all Christians, you know? I didn't... Uh, I didn't know there was another world out there apart from church till I got to drive. Because <laughs> that's all we ever did, you know. We went to church. So here's, when I talk about rebellion against God and he stepped in, he didn't treat us as enemies, but he extended his grace and forgiveness to us through his son Jesus Christ. See, I, I, don't, I don't always understand that idea of rebellion because, you know, the, my biggest rebellion at 10 years old was taking a bath, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that was it. That just, I made that up. I, I don't know what my greatest rebellion at 10 years old was, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't against God. See, maybe, maybe your experience as an adult is different. It probably is. But the point is, he didn't treat us as enemies, regardless of where you are now in your walk with Jesus or, or, or not. Before we come to know Jesus Christ, we are at war with God. And he says Jesus came in order to make peace. He extended that forgiveness and that peace to all of us if we were in outright rebellion, denial, or just not in relationship. See, that, uh, instead, God returned his love for my evil, for your evil in order to pave the path for us to get back on good terms with him. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the penalty for your sin, he made peace with God for you in order so that you might have the peace of God. And see, that's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about here that he wants to extend to those who have crossed us. And, and if you're still mentally focusing on that person right now, the one who's crossed you, and maybe it's not just a person. Maybe it's a group of people. Then my guess is that a question has probably popped up in your mind right now. Why? Why should I return goodwill for ill will? See, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, the answer is simple. Because Jesus said that's the pattern of living he wants us to live. Jesus has said that's the course of action that he wants us as disciples to take. That he wants his people to pursue. And because Jesus said it, that should be enough. Now I know forgiving your enemies, your adversaries, your opponents, whatever you want to call them, your in-laws... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm kidding about that. Uh, it goes against every impulse that we have in our human nature. When, when we're hit, our knee-jerk response is to hit back harder. So if we're going to be who Jesus has called us to be, we clearly need some help. Paul said in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, we're going to read that together because I think sometimes we need to hear it coming out of our own mouths, okay? So, uh, it's, but instead of as far as it depends on you, I want you to substitute me. 
for you. Not me, Bruce. You know, as far as it depends on Bruce, no. As far as it depends on me, okay? So here we go. One, two, three. If it is possible, as far as it depends on me, live at peace with everyone. You see, the, the Bible puts the onus on us. Not as, not as far as it depends on that person I don't like, but as far as it depends on me. I'm to live at peace with everyone. How can I do that? Because you have the peace of God. You have peace with God. So you share that peace with and especially for your enemies. How do we do that? Follow the peace, what, the peace process, P-E-A-C-E. We're going to spell out peace, okay? And the first thing you do is pray. Pray. See, and I think sometimes before we pray, before we sit down and start praying for our enemies, we probably ought to start by praying for ourselves. Because left to ourselves, we won't do this. Come on, just being honest. We won't do it. So we got to pray for ourselves that God will give us the capacity to love the person we don't even like. (laughs) And if you're having trouble letting go of your animosity, your bitterness, you need to tell God about it. Admit your reluctance to give it up and ask him to help you. Ask him to help you to deal with your resentment, your hostility, and your anger. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ask God to safeguard their health. Ask God to bless their families. Ask God to encourage them. And here's the bonus. If it applies, ask for them to see their own need for God. Because they may not have that. They may not have that understanding. When you do that, your attitude toward that enemy, toward that opponent, toward that adversary will begin to change. Because here's the deal. You can't pray for people for very long and still hate them. All of a sudden, when you're praying positively on their behalf, you, all of a sudden you start seeing them as God sees them. Pray. Secondly, E, empathize with others. Empathize with others. Which means we need to see these folks that we are enemies with from a totally different perspective. Choose to see them from the perspective of their value to God. See, they have a supreme worth. They have eternal value because they bear God's image. Even though it might be distorted and obscured, by sin and failure in their life. But when we start seeing our enemies as people who matter to God and people for whom Jesus died, yeah, yeah, they tend to begin to matter more to us. The Bible te- confirms that truth that God takes no pleasure in, in destroying evil people, wicked people. Look what it says in Ezekiel. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. So here's the thing. If God can have compassion on the wicked and he knows people who are really really wicked and he takes no pleasure in their death just stop and think for a minute about that person that you have brought to mind can you look beyond their bad behavior and get a glimpse of how much that person matters to God P-E-A-P-E-A. There we are. A, act. Now, this is, this is, now that starts getting tough. 
Because, <laughs> okay, I can pray for them. I can pray for them, you know. I, okay, I can even see, you know, from where they are. I, I can empathize with them. Now, all of a sudden, it gets serious. All right, look what Jesus says. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Wow. Hold that up there for me a second. Because I, I want you to look at this. Do good to those who hate you. Now, I know, I know you're thinking, I, I don't know how to do that. I, 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 I'm not sure how to do that. Well, it's real easy, believe it or not. You know what you do for people you love and the things you do for them. Just do that for people you don't even like. <laughs> see, see how that works? That's, that's, that's all he's saying. Do good to those who hate you. And the next phrase there is, bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. That means when a, when a person shoots bitter words your way, you fight the urge to shoot back. Because usually that's where we are. If somebody says something mean and nasty to us, what, 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 you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what, I don't know what that, you know, if you were to say something bad to me, I'd, you know, monkey face. I don't know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Whatever, you know. That's our urge. That's our, that's our, that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to shoot right back with just as mean and hateful words as we can possibly come up with. <laughs> And as difficult as it seems, we need to resist the temptation because it may not just always be to their face. Most times it's not, is it? We need to resist the temptation to traffic in rumors and traffic in gossip and traffic in unfair criticism. Instead, when Jesus talks about turning the other cheek, sometimes somebody with their words slap you upside the face. Like a two before between the eyes. We, we have all kinds of metaphors we use when somebody says something really hateful and mean to us. And Jesus is saying, hey, you don't fight back like that. You turn the other cheek. You offer, respond with kind words, considerate language. And I'll tell you, those acts of kindness can go a long way toward dismantling the barriers of animosity. P-E-A-C, confess my part. <laughs> I'm, it's not getting any easier <laughs> because more times than not whether we like to admit it or not we share the blame it's a two way street for pushing a person into the role of being our enemy maybe it's my jealousy or maybe it's my stubbornness or my prejudice or my bad attitude that contributes to the rift between us. I'm going to tell you, you say, well, what's, all, what's the point of all this? Because I'll tell you, there is a direct correlation between confession, confessing my part, and healing. When we will take time to honestly assess the situation and admit to ourselves, then admit to God, and ultimately admit to our adversary that we share some of the blame. Uh, we, and we do. Some of the blame. Maybe all the blame. Maybe not all of it. Maybe part of it. Maybe some of it. But we share in that because of the way sometimes we respond when we respond wrongly. But when we're willing to confess it to ourselves, confess it to God, and ultimately confess it to our adversary, that's a big step toward healing the effects of hate. James says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then he adds this, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Few things accelerate the peace process as much as humbly admitting our own wrongdoing and asking forgiveness for it. E-P-E-A-C-E, -E, emulate. Emulate. 
Paul says in Ephesians, the very first five, chapter 5, verse 1, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Whenever we're not quite sure how to love an enemy, not quite sure how to do that. I, I, I know I need to. I know Jesus tells me to. I'm not quite sure how to do it. Whenever we hesitate because we're perplexed on how to proceed, we know we need to do something. We, I, I don't know how to make this happen. Whenever we wonder if we've gone far enough in our effort to reconcile, all we've got to do is take a look at the example that Jesus modeled for us and model our lives, emulate our lives after his because he set the ultimate standard. Think about this. While the iron spikes were being driven through his hands and feet, while he had been whipped and slapped and spit upon, while he hung there in absolute pain, he prayed for his tormentors. And we know what he prayed. It's recorded for us when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, here's the thing. We know that's recorded for us. And all uh, the gospel writers record uh, that or similar phrase to that, uh, that Jesus spoke on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But the construction in the Greek language indicates that Jesus kept on praying that prayer. It wasn't just a one-time thing. Probably with every slap to his face, with every crack of the whip across his back, whatever they were doing, throwing rocks, whatever it was, as he was making his way to Calvary, all of that going on, and then nailing him to the cross, and then hurling insults, as the Scripture says, towards him the whole time. He's saying, maybe with every comment, maybe with every spit or slap or driving of the spike he is continually saying father forgive them they don't know what they're doing and there's our model so my question is if the cruel torture of crucifixion could not silence Jesus prayer to forgive his enemies, let me just ask you, what pain, what pride, what prejudice, how much does it take to silence your prayer for forgiveness for your enemies? The only way we can ever emulate Jesus Christ is by yielding ourselves to God's Holy Spirit and His influence in our life that will allow us, when we yield to the Spirit, will allow us to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control because then and only then will that allow us to hang in there in the face of injustice, to identify those whom we consider to be our enemies, to do what Jesus has set the example for us to do and is commanding us to do, to understand why forgiveness in our world, in our life, makes sense and how we can implement forgiveness through the peace process in our lives expressed toward those that we consider enemies. That's the, the who, the what, the why, the how. All that's left is the when and the where. And frankly, that's up to you. Let's pray. Father, it is no secret. There's nobody in this room or watching online today that hasn't experienced the pain of injustice. There's always or has always been or will always be somebody in our lives that treats us unfairly with intent to hurt and to cause pain and grief. But Father, I also know 
that we've also been on the distribution side of injustice where we've treated people unfairly criticized them unjustly treated them hurtfully and father maybe there's folks in this room right now who are still carrying that hurt maybe they're listening and watching online and they're still carrying the pain and they're very aware of the pain they have caused we have caused and so God we start by asking for your forgiveness for our part in creating enemies And we pray today through the power of your Holy Spirit that we can forgive those who have hurt us and be forgiving. And that, Father, we repent of those times we've hurt others. Intentionally, unintentionally, if it's created a rift, if it's created an enemy then please forgive us. Help us, starting today, empower us to use the peace process. And if it starts with just a simple prayer, that's a beginning, the beginning to peace. Father, our desire is to be like you. That's what a disciple is, to becoming like Jesus every day. And this is one of those areas we've just kind of, you know, ignored or conveniently ignored because it's hard. So God, we ask today, help us to be just like you. That in the pain of hurt and enemies all around, your prayer was still for forgiveness. May that be our prayer as well. That not only we ask you to forgive, but that you be forgiving and you expect nothing less of us to forgive and to be forgiving. For your glory and our growth, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing this song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And maybe, you know, maybe this is, a, as I said, not so much preaching but meddling a little today. And maybe there is someone on your mind and on your heart that you have a problem with. I would like to encourage you for this chorus to be an act of commitment. That I've decided to follow Jesus all the way to the path of reconciliation and peace in my life and in those that I have considered my enemies today. I'm following Jesus and I'm pursuing peace. Or maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. And today is your day to decide to follow Jesus. We're going to stand and sing. And if you're ready to make that decision or if you want to have a conversation about that, I'm going to invite you to step out and make your way to the front. Or just be where you are and make this a song of commitment that today I'm following him to peace and reconciliation in my life. Let's stand. Let's sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. before me the world 
get uh, your pre-packaged communion out it was through the cross that's the cross before me the world behind me when you consider the cross and the agony and the torture that Jesus experienced on your behalf on my behalf and still prayed for forgiveness the cross before me and the way the world looks at everything is you know I don't get mad, I get even. Well, the cross reminds us that the world is behind us and forgiveness is in front of us. And it was through his act on the cross that we receive forgiveness. Christ died once and for all. One of my favorite passages. To bring us to God. It was through his death. That he established peace with God. And as a result we have the peace of God. And we're to be peacemakers. I started this series the first Sunday of January. Talking about happy are the peacemakers. You're going to be a whole lot more happier when you're a peacemaker, especially with your enemies. And that's what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And so each week we take time to remember that sacrifice through this time of communion. So let's eat the wafer together, remembering the body of Christ. And the cup that represents the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let's drink the cup together. Lord, we are thankful. We know we are so unworthy for what you have done for us. But Lord, we want to be who you called us to be who you've asked us to be, even who you've commanded us to be. And it's hard for us because we live in a world that's dominated by Satan. Sometimes his influence on us is, is more than we can bear. So God, as we start this new week, help us to be the peacemakers. Help us to be the reconcilers. Help us to be the ones who bring peace, not who destroy it. With everyone, not just the ones we like or the ones that look like us, but with everyone. You've brought peace to us. Now, Father, empower us to share the peace that passes all understanding with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us today online, uh, our Unity Christian Church services. Each week, we premiere at 8 o'clock every Sunday, and uh, we thank you for being a part of that. For more information about our church, you can go to unitychristianchurch.net to our website and uh, find a connection to our services as well as that additional information about how you can give and how you can connect with us further. God bless you. Have a great week and be safe.